So today we have on a lot of like three guests for as speakers for this session, this this panel, let's say panel discussion. So this will be uh, uh this will be casual. So if you have anything, please feel free to, to add at the end or maybe like just just see how it goes. Yeah. So this this session is actually called Korean on craft craft practice. Sorry. Microphone. Oh, okay. The microphone is for the video, it's not for, you know, okay. the is louder, sorry. So, yeah. shall we reach in? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. 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 Uh, for each exhibition, and this time we decided that we would have a talk because three of uh, three of actually from, uh, members that from originally from Iota from Perth are here. So this session is called Perth of Crafts, Craft Practice in Western Australia and in the Indian Ocean context. So this is this was in translation ex exhibition is actually a cultural exhibition with Iota. In an ocean craft trialing of 2024. Uh, so today we have with us Jude Vanderbilt, the founding member and co curator of IOTA 24, and next to me, Marissa Cameron, a participating artist in Lost in Translation, the work who works over there, and Holly Obihan, another participating artist in Lost in Translation, who works over there. So we can mingle around later. So maybe we can start a little bit about, uh, for the introduction of each, uh, each, each speakers. So maybe Jude, can you start with your introduction with us today? So maybe can I introduce, uh, can I invite Jude to start introducing yourself a little bit on your guest? Sure. Uh, I don't think this is working, is it? Uh, no, it's recording. Okay. All right. Um, thank you so much, Hassan, and thank you, Nati, for really embracing the whole idea of the Indian Ocean Craft Training and what it could mean in the future for all of us. Um, uh, as I say, says, my name is Judy Van Murphy. I'm from Western Australia. Western Australia is on the very edge of the Indian Ocean and we are a colony, country, first colonial base. We have had the usual failings that a lot of people from um, English, Scottish, Irish heritage have, in that we're not very good at looking out to our neighbours and learning from our neighbours. And we live in an incredibly rich region. We are on the same time zone as most of the Southeast Asia. It's quicker for us to get to Indonesia than it is to get to Sydney in our country. So. We started the Indian Ocean Craft Trail in 2021 and with the idea to bring and show and share contemporary craft made by makers from all around our region. So in 2021, we were able to bring Wutabai Seraphon's work and the first work that he'd made using that technique with the jewel beetles and Jakai Sirabut from um, Thailand. This year we weren't so lucky, we had Thai Australian art speakers through the last uh, showing work with us. Um, I think that's them for me, that's the introduction, right? Yes, yes, thank <laughs> you. So, can I invite Melissa Um Yeah, hi, um, thank you yeah, Angie and hi Sam for inviting us here. Uh, so, I am a yeah, West Australian artist. I work predominantly within ceramics at the moment. Um, I do still dabble in quite a bit of fibre and textile as well. I do like that combination of multiple um, medias, but also uh, definitely that craft and the handmade, the tactility. Um, it's, you know, on a very personal level, it's something that I'm always drawn to with my making uh, and a lot of my practice or the the works that I make talk about environmental issues and a lot a lot to do with agriculture within I mean Australia as a whole but also the West Australian region that I grew up in so yeah a lot of cross kind of areas of agriculture and um, construction um, yes that's 
Yes, that's a short little intro. Yes, 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 thank you, because we'll go through pretty deeper uh, later. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Melissa. Hi, I am Melissa Cameron. I am from Western Australia, but I've also lived in Melbourne and Seattle. And uh, my move probably to Seattle was really influential on my works, which became quite medical whilst living in the United States. Um, I started in jewellery and metalsmithing, but have recently transitioned to larger public artworks, um, often still very handmade with the ethos of craft and important part of the work, the time that craft takes and the materiality of craft is very important uh, to my works. Um, I have a background in interior architecture and I did do some studies in computer science as well, so they also inform my current projects. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So we'll go... Can you speak up? Okay. Yeah, so we will have like several uh, topics to discuss. Uh, so from now I will just like raise some questions and then maybe invite uh, each of the our speakers to see uh, to talk about their views on this uh, particular issue. So the first topic that I would like you guys to share is like uh, is how does the geographical and cultural diversity of Indian Ocean region influence the theme and materials used in Western Australian craft? Uh, can I invite Holly to start on this because we were talking about how you, your materialities work with your environmental and agricultural context in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, well, no, this is some images from Joe, you know, but, um, sorry, I need a question again. Um, uh, I guess the, the one thing to point out with Western Australia, or Australia is obviously our, the geographical maps of that land, um, and how how diverse the landscape is on its own um, and I guess that especially when it comes to then uh, materials we I think both as you know as ceramics and then working with metal we've got the landscape very rich in these raw materials and minerals and they do kind of organically feed into a lot of art practices I know that my work in particular is um, very inspired by the, the land, the physical land of clay. Um, and we're also very sandy kind of landscapes, especially around Perhulu area. So finding clay is a bit of a novelty at some, at some times. Um, but I also, I think a lot of um, ceramic artists <laughs> very differently to a lot of other artists is we've got a very limited amount of material in the world. There's only so much clay and as soon as we fire something that is no longer do it, completely changing the chemistry of our material and it can never be reversed. So it's a um, that idea of having to be careful of our materials is um, I think something that a lot of you know West Australia always surrounds us across the world, but that's definitely you know, something that I I know I have to take into consideration when making work, which ironically is quite often about the environment and our limited amount of minerals. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Holly. Um, any because let me say you were using metal, right? And mm -hmm. then sometimes it's recycled materials as well. Can you add a little bit more of that in this topic? Sure, yes. I work a lot in steel um, and Western Australia is one of the largest iron ore producers in the world uh, and home of some of the largest iron ore companies in the world. So uh, I generally work with recycled steel and typically post-consumer so it's already been made into an object before it gets to my hands. Uh, so I've worked with uh, corrugated sheet metal from recycled sources and the work in this particular exhibition is all from street sweeper blades. So it's very common in uh, larger West, well, yeah, Australian slash American context, the places where I have lived, for there to be motorised street sweepers 
that uh, have steel bristles and as steel work hardens it tends to snap off and get caught in the gutters and potentially end up in waterways inside of these countries. So uh, I have a habit and I've managed to coerce a few of my friends to have the same collective habit of picking up steel street sweeper blades. Um, and generally speaking, the works that I make are in protest to something. So the works that I've made out of steel, the larger works lately have been in protest to particular things that have happened in the Western Australian context. Um, the, there's a large piece that will be in the slides later that is called Jukan Tears mm -hmm. that uh, protests the disruption and destruction of um, some Aboriginal sacred sites in the northwest of Western Australia that were destroyed in the pursuit of iron ore recovery. Um, and in the current pieces that I'm working on now are street sweeper blades that are put in service to creating a message about climate change. So um, the, the geography has sort of helped sh turn me away from using new steel product and made me be quite adaptive about what recycled steel product I could find. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. So for this topic, Yes, uh, I would like to invite George to add a little bit more because you are co-founder of this IOTA as well. So I think you have something in your mind when you think like this is, this is it. It has to be in the ocean as well. What's uh, the common things that make you come up with this? Yeah, that's right. I think that the, the thing for us, and it's maybe I thought useful to explain this to uh, people from here, is about the cultural diversity of Western Australia. We are basically all boat people, except for the people who came well before us, the Indigenous people of Australia, who have had a history of over 60,000 years that's been recorded and is now known about. This is work from the Junkie Desert Weavers, so they live in the middle of Western Australia. And um, this work, in fact, is made out of ruined car seats that they then wove from wrecked cars. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the cultural diversity right across our country, this is the work from Brian Robinson, who's based on the far east coast in their uh, ends in Australia. So he talks about his own history and his own culture. And this is a work from a Nunga Maori artist who, so again, a combination of cultures of Maori and uh, Western Australian Aboriginal heritage. This piece actually is talking about the fact that young Nunga people can't speak. They have, they have to hear all of these other voices and no one's really listening to her. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, this is a, um, a work that's been made and you know, shown currently, but I guess it comes back to this whole idea of this cultural identity, but who we are in that space. Um, by Trish Little, and this is the work of Melissa. Do you want to speak to you more to that? Sure, this is one of the pieces I spoke of earlier that protests the destruction of the Jukan shelters. It's called Japan Tears, and it's a little hard to see, but on the right-hand side of this image are 4,600 teardrop shapes. They're all quite small, and they were actually used, so teardrop on teardrop. That's what creates the line work that you see in this piece. So this piece is uh, lines made out of removed metal material. Um, it depicts the Rio Tinto building, which happens to be the tallest building in Western Australia, in Perth, the capital city. Um, and the way that it's made out of teardrop shapes, uh, there's one teardrop for every 10 years of culture that was destroyed when the Junkin Shears were destroyed in 2020. And then the background is actually cut into specific lengths so that I could convey the message in a modified version of Morse code. So sort of a pictorial version of Morse code. Um, it spells out the message, Jukan shelters destroyed for dot, 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 I and all. Um, and it uses that corrugated metal. And the way that I flattened it out was by uh, cutting 
directly into all of the peaks and the troughs of the metal. So it kind of, it has a slight wave left to it, but it's mostly flat. Um, and so that sort of dictated the grit that I based the work on. Um, and it was hand sawn um, over about six months in 2020. So it was a very long project. I had an assistant for about 150, 60 hours of the project. And then I did about the other 800 hours of my thing. I just wanted to add that business about cultural diversity and what Western Australia is made of. There are over 249 languages regularly spoken in Western Australia and close to 20% of the people who live in that state speak a language other than English at home. So the, the, the spread and the, the depth of the different cultures that have come to live in that part of the world is quite considerable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I think that leads to our next topic, actually, that we are going to discuss. It's like, how does the tri triennial like IOTA help shaping contemporary craft in Western Australia or in Australia in general? I think it's more related to like... Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I think it's like more related to, I think Western Australia has this character of the contemporary craft in itself. Can I uh, ask you to expand on that and maybe oh. Melissa and Holly to add something? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so yeah. um, we probably should have spoken about that image of Holly's work that was there before, but I guess, you know, what we're trying to do is to encourage young voices, new voices, strong voices to speak to us and to share their knowledge and experience. But also it's important for us that this is through the medium of craft. And the, the, the and I should have probably said this before, but... Craft those traditions of textiles, metal, wood, glass, all the rest of them, can't remember them right now, they are part of this whole region. They're embedded in the region. They're embedded in people's knowledge, their experiences, how they worship, how they use materials, how they have, use utensils. That's been the basic root for all of the art practices that have come since. And that's also the area which is actually most fragile in lots of ways. Craft has become something that um, we see so much of it and we think maybe it doesn't have a value particularly. We see it translated into cheap plastic and metal objects. Um, and we, the, the space between the maker and the maker's mind is getting much more distant. So I'm sorry for that diversion. Uh, but I think that the idea is, is that these voices of younger people and younger artists are, are really critical. This is a work by an Iranian-Australian artist that's on show now, and it's a very powerful work. You can only see a tiny part of it, but it is the story, each of those wooden lions is the story of a young woman and a young life lost in Iran to the morality police. And the artist made a decision. She understood that if she made this work, she would never be able to go back to Iran. But it's important to her to share that story in her community and in Western Australia and to fi help find voices for all the young women who have lost their lives. Um, sorry, is there another one? Uh, no. So I, I think that that space is, I, I think demonstrating through ambitious making is helping to shape both Western Australian craft practice and um, more broadly. Mm. Oh, I don't know what to, where do I go from here? Please add maybe. Talk. Talk, talk about this yes, about this work one, here. Yeah. yeah um, so uh, this work um, was titled "Inedible." Um, I and I guess an odd way to kind of go towards into this work. Um, so, as a as a white Australian, I'm probably I'm not the well most well versed in our natural environment and what is edible for us um, as humans um, compared to the 
First Nation people of the land who, you know, thousands and thousands of years of experience of understanding what that land can produce and what is um, consumable. Uh, so that was, I guess, this work was a little bit on that note of exploring those kind of mixed mixed cultures, I guess, and trying to understand our landscape as as a diverse and very um, plentiful landscape without, if it weren't for a lot of our destruction, I think, yeah. Maybe, Melissa, can you add a little bit because you were in the, in, I mean, in Canada as well and then you were back to Western Australia. So you see how, how it's like, how the context of Western Australia is important on this matter. Sure. Um, I, I was in Seattle, which is in the US. Um, and the thing to note about Western Australia is its isolation, even from the other half of the country. We are at least a two and a half hour plane ride from the closest other capital state, capital city of another state. And like Jude said, we're further away from Indonesia, from Bali, for instance, than we are from Sydney. So um, this isolation kind of breeds a different type of maker. Um, and I think part of the point of the Indian Ocean Craft Triennial is to put us into the context of our closer neighbours mm. and to make the point that we belong to that context, we belong to more of this part of the globe than we really do belong to, say, the global north and to places like the United States. Yet, because we share a, a language with England and America and other places like that, we, we tend to look more towards those places. And I think generally that's possibly misguided because there are larger population centres and there are potential for more interaction and friendship groups and understanding around the Indian Ocean than there is with those places that are really very far away from us. So I think the thing that I've noticed since moving back to Western Australia is that there is a certain resilience in having a small population centre clinging to the edge of an ocean. You, you learn the importance of different things than if you have access to larger cities and to bigger population centres. But at the same time, it can make us a little more insular. So I think something like the craft triennial is very important to make sure that we spend more time looking towards the regions that could really help serve us. Okay. Could I add yes, to that? Yeah. It's um, just interesting that idea, of, yeah, the isolation of Perth mm -hmm. and this Indian Ocean, um, our connection within the ocean. I was just recently over in Canberra, which is our capital city on the East Coast, and Talking to fellow artists there, they were like, whoa, you've come so far. Wow, all the way from Perth, you speak a different language over there. <laughs> so, and then kind of being part of this show and other IOTA um, kind of that community feels so much more welcoming and like it really does feel like we are more part of this Indian Ocean community, even from like the, the outside observer. We're not quite part of the rest of Australia either. But we're, yeah, feeling quite, yeah, a lovely little community that's being built through IOTA, yeah, and the crafts that way. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting that that the region really shaping the way craft is understood in Indian Ocean more, like, closely together than to, to like, to to other parts in Australia. So that leads to the next topic, which is like, in what ways are contemporary Western Australian craft practitioners like you two as well as Jude, who are who's curator, challenging the traditional definitions of craft because I think uh, in the Indian Ocean region, craftsmanship is like some something that very basic in everyday life and everything are like maybe part of like uh, white, uh, maybe like as an Australian white people, I mean, uh, I mean, culture and traditions, maybe you can add something on this, this one. Can I ask Melissa first on this? Thank you. Sure. 
So I don't know what it's still cheese. I can't remember. I suppose. Well, a few well ago. we're just testing. Ah. Okay. And so Matt. Oh, okay. Beautiful. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, um, oh, yeah, you go. Yeah. Sorry, which was the question then? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's talking about this. Was it? In um, what way? Can you you yes. yeah. How are we challenging oh, traditional one. definitions of crafts? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a good question. <laughs> I think um, in my practice, I think the scale, because I am a jeweler, um, I, I'm used to the advantages of making things that are quite... Uh, there's an advantage to working in miniature. When you can see the whole object in a single glance, you can um, you can appreciate um, a whole worldview uh, quite simply. And also scale. When you when you do make things in miniature, it's it's like seeing a, yeah a, a really like being able to see the moon in a single capture. Um, the miniature really gives you uh, that cute advantage, which is a terrible way to put it. But um, whereas when I'm making larger works, um, scale becomes more of an issue. Mm -hmm. And I think um, for, for my practice, it, even though I have the interior architecture background, um, working up makes you really have to be careful about how you layer things and how things might be um, photographed or interpreted differently when you can't fit them all inside of a single mm -hmm. lens. I don't know that I'm expressing yes, this particularly yes. well. And that's it. So it's like your your work is more like, because it's like, it's not only, because it's jewelry as well. Yes, it's not yeah. how it's presented each individually, but how it's presented like, in an exhibition as a group or uh, in like what you're wearing. I think it's something like that. Yes, yeah. yeah. I think typically my photography was me able to wear a single work and therefore I was able to convey a feeling in the photographs that I have taken. But now I have to um, photograph the work without that type of context. And so I am, um, yeah, a, a bit more vulnerable to different interpretations because Jewelry interpretations are always helped mm -hmm. by an understanding of preciousness and by an understanding of the souvenir and all of the other layering that typically jewelry has, which gets stripped away when I start making larger work. So mm -hmm. I suppose my context has shifted in this when I have shifted scale and it's made it. Yeah, that's that's part of the challenge of making okay. this kind of work at the moment. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah. Holly, what about you? Uh, how do the how do you like as craft practitioner challenge traditional definition of craft because you use a lot of mixed materials as well in your work? Yeah, I um yeah, I think definitely incorporating multiple mediums and techniques is though you know, those where it begins in um exploring different avenues um for outcomes. Uh I have um yeah, I think also, you know, there's a lot of these beautiful crafts that for a long time there's always been um, amazing trade schools and places where you're taught the absolutely perfect traditional way to create something, such as, say, ceramics. There's, you know, and there aren't that many places like that now in Australia where you were you were an apprentice, you went and you learned how to throw a cigarette bowl, a cigarette tray for, you know, that was the first year of your apprenticeship. Whereas now I think in, I think all of Australia, really our trades or our skills that we're being taught at, on like school, um, different teaching levels, they're actually falling away. Like we're losing a lot of our trade elements at university levels they're kind of closing all these departments high schools are pretty good still but um so for myself I didn't touch clay except for mucking around on the farm when I was a kid I didn't actually have a go at clay until I was 
maybe 25 and I learnt very backwards as well. I was shown how to pack a kiln and fire other people's work first and it just kind of fell into that job and through that process I started to have my have a go at working with clay, playing with it. Um, so that kind of education was quite weird, backwards, and it allowed me to be, to push the limits and really question, like I might have been told by an amazing, you know, Stuart Scambler, an amazing ceramicist, it's like, oh, you can't do this, you can't put this in the kiln. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, why not? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, and, you know, so that idea of, you know, even though we might be losing a lot of these um, skill-based facilities and teachers, I think that's also then leading the younger creatives into being more experimental and pushing past that. Yeah. And, it, Is that and if I could just yeah. um, build on that, because it's, it's, it's exactly what Holly's talking about, but the, the issue, and Melissa's talking about the issues of scale, but the issues of tradition, this work, but it's also the issues of people. So this work by Anne Samat, uh, a Malaysian artist who began her career as a trained weaver and has taken that weaving to this sort of big material um, uh, changes where she will incorporate absolutely anything. So there are rakes and all sorts in that work. This work by Bapaditya Biswas from Kolkata, who has worked with weavers for many, many years, but he will go and sit with the weaver and push and get them to change and get them, to ask them to try this. What will happen if we do this? What will happen if we do that? So the weavers are learning new skills and new objects are being created from those great traditions. And um, this is all made possible in many, many ways by an extraordinary, for, for us in Australia, uh, by an extraordinary collector called Confer Carbo from Indonesia, who is really showing the way and what it means to collect brave, different, unusual works. This is the work of Abdi Setiawan from uh, Indonesia, and he's talking about the loss of villages and the people around the table who make the decisions as to what, to, what trees and what forests to pull down. So having those people be part of IOTA is the part that really is the cultural enrichment as well as bringing their work. Mm. Okay. Maybe I would like you to add a little bit more about like what you've seen over the years. Actually, this is not in the questions, but once you've ta talked about that and when you, you guys talk about this, about the context of the challenging the traditional definitions and Jude, you come up with this IOTA. So you see, you wanted, I think in a way you wanted to show the people how contemporary craft or another interpretation of crafts can be. Can you add a little bit more about like what you've seen over the years about what the craftsmanship are like in Western Australia? Uh, well, it's, it's kind of almost an impos okay. impossible <laughs> question really, because I think that there is no limit to what people can invent and how people can think about the place they live and how they live within it and what what objects that they might make that enrich their lives and other people's lives and allow us another way of seeing, which is exactly what Melissa and Holly do. What uh, Far has done with his um, incredible weavings, um, what Jakai has done with his stories of, um, particularly these memories of his mother and those histories and stitching all of those histories and stories together. What Rudy's been doing when I first met her some years ago, looking at traditional bell making here in Thailand, there is, there is so much, there's so much wealth and richness and knowledge and desire for experimentation that I kind of can't see us getting to the end of that for a very long time. And I, I guess there was, there must have been, there's a gap within the art scene mm -hmm. within WA and Perth that needed to be heroed. So this is kind of, it's finally, yeah. you know, and that, that weird kind of position that we're in as being, you know, a very Western white colonial kind of space. 
neighboured by these incredibly diverse countries and cultures with the craft that's just everywhere. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And sorry, I should probably add, iota is one thing. It's um, it's an a number of exhibitions. Um, this is this year's catalogue for IOTA. Um, and it, with the artists from all over the place. But what, what IOTA has done as well is it's encouraged um, other makers in Western Australia. So as well as the six exhibitions that we've curated, there's another 60 exhibitions, including this one, of course, that Marvellous Atty has produced and Haiseng has curated, and another one in Kuala Lumpur that opens in a couple of days' time. So it's, in Western Australia only, it's giving a little voice, a small voice to people and a bit of courage, and people are making works that are much more ambitious. Mm. Just yes. back at the question for a second, because I'm reminded by Rudy and her current works that are on display that I think craftspeople have become the new material scientists to a certain extent, that uh, we are the people who, seeing the challenges that uh, our our environment is currently in, we are finding new ways to work with, with cast-off materials and other materials to try and find a way forward. Uh, that isn't using fast manufacturing, it's using slower craft, uh, but the, the, the skill that you have from handmaking objects to reinterpret things that are fabricated uh, en masse and by machines. We, are, we have possibly a bit more time slash a bit more, um, I'm, I'm going to say ADD, but a certain uh, a certain um, focus. hyper focus, exactly. A bit of neurodiversity in that we want to challenge ourselves with existing materials to see what else we can do with them. And I think that's the advantage. And the issue with losing some of our craft education centres is that um, I have done a design degree and I have done a fine arts degree in order to get my craft skills up to a certain level. And I think it's very important that we have that hand time in order to really understand and be able to push materials because in as much as I've worked in the design world and specified them, I was never able to play with them in the same way as when I did my craft degrees. And I think that hands-on time as any builder will tell you, you don't you don't have the real knowledge until you've tested and really worked with the material for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I think we can discuss about that later if anyone has like yeah. questions because it's something that's happening here as well, like the, about the craft, like about the education in craft. I think mm -hmm. many people might uh, might might want. Maybe someone would want to add something about this later in our like Q and A or discussion, but uh, but because you are talking about this and then about the voices of of craft uh craftsmanships and artists and and then like with especially with Melissa and Holly, I see that the use of form as well as materiality actually convey some sort of like it's kind of using craftsmanship as a form of political and social commentary with the Indian Ocean context. Maybe can I have Melissa to add something about this? Uh... Certainly, yeah. And I think I mentioned earlier that my move to Seattle, I was making socially conscious works before I left Australia, but um, they became all up protest works when I moved to the United States. And this is one of the first works I made living inside the US. Um, politics are, are in some ways less in your face. Like in Australia, in Melbourne, you could get into a cab and have a political discussion about the current leaders that you would not be able to have in the US. But at the same time, you would drive through a neighborhood and you would see everyone's signs for who they were going to vote for up in their front yards. And a lot of uh, appointments are politicized, even say, you know, the, the board of education president would be politicized. That would be an elected representative. So this 
first work was sort of about being brought up on street corners about particular issues and people then being quite mealy mouthed and not saying exactly what it was that they wanted to say. They would say things very euphemistically. And having not grown up in the United States, I would be left thinking, oh, I wonder what side of the issue this person is on. But if I had all of the codes, I would have been able to unlock that very quickly. But because I hadn't been there very long, um, I was having trouble. So this Broach was sort of a band stop, save, fight, solve. It was like, I, I understand that the message is trying to get out there, but I don't know exactly what the message is just yet. And so this was the first work. And then I think my work's probably got a little more explicit. This was um, a work entitled Gun that I made after the Sandy Hook massacre in 2012, which was the biggest massacre that happened in the United States the first year that I lived in America. And this one, um, I had to leave off until making until, or well, till finishing until 2014. I, I made other political works in the interim, but I, I just didn't know how to tackle this message because I'd watch Biden and Obama fail so miserably at getting any sort of change after this particular event. Um, this is the um, AR-15 style weapon. It was a Bushmaster Pro. It was a hunting rifle that was used by the shooter inside of the, handy, uh, the Sandy Hook uh, massacre. Um, and this work has all of these holes that I individually cut out of the piece. So there are 77 uh, round holes and then that those were then used in this neck piece that was 15 metres long. Um, the 77 holes plus all of the actual kind of bits of confetti used on the neck piece equals 154, um, which is the amount of uh, rounds that were fired inside of the school by the shooter using two different weapons. Um, and then the 15 metres is uh, at one to four scale, the amount of um, travel that he would have had to do the minimum amount. I sort of downloaded maps of the school and found out what classrooms that he went into and then made my line work on the on the floor plans and figured out the, the minimum distance that he would have had to be inside of the school to kind of give a landscape of what happened and to give me sort of something to work with. So that that's what that piece was about that is now in the collection of the University of Iowa Museum of Art. And this was another piece that I made at the end of living in the United States. Um, this was sort of a reaction to the uh, massacre that happened in 2017 uh, in Las Vegas, where I think 53 people were killed and that became the new largest massacre. Uh, it was almost like every year we sort of had Pulse nightclub after Sandy Hook and then we had the Nevada shootings. And so, um, this one, I wanted to uh, memorialise all the other lives lost to gun violence because there was always a, a huge amount of press, but it was treated as if it was a tornado, that there was nothing that could be done about the, the shootings in the United States, but there could be a lot of press to generate a lot more fear, which is kind of what the US runs on. Um, but I wanted to memorialise, you know, another day of gun violence rather than that particular day because that one had so much attention. So I thought, well, I'll just start on January 1 of 2017. And, you know, the, the shooting that uh, was the impetus for it was in sort of September, October of 2017. And I thought, I will, I will just, I'll go from, you know, the 1st of January and I'll keep going until I get to the 53 lives lost. Mm -hmm. But it turns out January 1... Uh, in 2017, there was about 73 lives lost. So then I just did one day of gun violence. So I, I took objects, I, people volunteered objects. I asked my communities. Um, so this came from a friend who lives in San Francisco and she gave me this box so that I could um, make the weapon that was used in a shooting in that particular place. Um, and then the, the sort of, um, tag that accompanies it, um, it details the person who whose life was lost in that in that particular act of gun violence and so this work is 73 weapons that all get put up together um, and then the objects from which 
uh, they were taken from. And it was kind of important that the objects be containers um, with the idea that as soon as you put a large enough hole in a container, the container no longer contains. Um, so that was that, that was that series of works. Yes. Yeah, Holly, please. <laughs> the question was about uh, the form of political and social commentary that when you are using craft. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. So this um, object here was part of a, a series that I created called uh, Limited Minerals um, in a group show that was also just recently um, finished up at... Um, in Perth at IOTA at Gallery Central. Uh, so this body of work, I um, so a lot of what my practice has been leading up to this point is heroing and investigating the diverse natural um, flora of the southwest region of WA, which is um, like one of the world's kind of hot spots of flora diversity with um, most of the species there actually being endemic to that one little isolated spot. Um, so as my practice kind of flowed on, I then was taking on my um, my childhood of growing up on a farm and exploring and kind of just being in amongst quite large scale agricultural environments um, and understanding the difference between what is a weed, what is a natural flora, native flora, and that grey space in between. So a lot of our grasses have been, there's a lot of introduced grasses in Australia, a lot of introduced plants, um, and quite a lot of them, well, there is definitely a, a nice number of them that we use for cropping. So we've got, you know, wheat, rye, barley, all these introduced crops that are very important for you know that then gets shipped around the world like it's a very important part of the world's kind of um ability to eat and keep fed but these are all weeds within the country or the land that I grew up which has got such a amazing flora in its own right um so I was just kind of, I, I quite like that idea of then working speculatively of how maybe one day the, the flora will be able to um, turn against us humans, this idea of creating their own protective spikes that are not just gentle kind of little pricks, but something that can actually give a good a good bite back to, to humans and, and our destruction and and also that ability to maybe use all of this rubble, all of these materials that we have converted for our own infrastructure, that they, that then the environment will be able to evolve past that point that it's, you know, and we see it now, there's little weeds growing through those cracks in the concrete, no matter how many times we go through and try and spray it, pull them out, they keep coming back. So this idea that at some point this, I guess that element of hope within a quite dire environmental crisis that maybe the plants will be able to fight back and take back what what has been lost to them. Yeah. Like yeah. Apocalyptic. <laughs> A bit apocalyptic, absolutely. And that and see, I see that as hopeful. I'm like, yes, let the plants take over. Let them, you know, if if humans were eliminated, the world would be an amazing place. Um, so that idea of absolutely that growth, that slowly creeping through to take over. Um, but in saying that, again, of course, that irony in using clay and converting it into ceramic that can no longer be used or goes back into the earth and using all these other minerals for the glazes and, and then the firing process, like it's... I'm, yeah, I'm digging myself into a hole of trying to, you know, show this, you know, be quite environmentally forward facing and yet I'm one of, you know, I'm just as, I'm just as bad as my father who is a farmer. That's kind of, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, this is um, another uh, work that I've had in an IOTA show at Colbutch Space that was curated by um, Sandra Murray 
Um, but this idea of, so these um, works, I've introduced some more bright colours. I've quite often worked with much more, I guess, natural colours, na um, browns and greens and something that seems quite, especially compared to Australian landscape, we've got very, we don't have bright greens and even the flowers are very tiny. But this kind of exploration went into that idea of introducing some synthetic elements to it as well. And that idea of perhaps there are these hybrid um, uh, plants that have um, weeds and native flora kind of come together. They're able to create this next step in evolution that might then have a fighting chance against the human, the human impact. Yeah. Yeah. Please add something about the practice, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't mean, that you know, I don't mean to, they cover it so well. I mean, I guess this thing, mm -hmm. it's about political, social, mm -hmm. economic bravery and looking at the world and making comment. So I, I think these are the things that, that make the work strong, that make, mm -hmm. yes. um, that make exhibitions interesting and compelling. Yes, yeah, I agree. Because we see like the materialities that Melissa and Holly use in their practices are very rich and the material itself it speaks about the concept already. And once it's formed in like spike or with like this hoop, uh, like of like of this blade is kind of like making the the interpretation of the materials like richer, stronger. Yeah. Okay, so I think we may have a few minutes to probably Q&A if anyone has any questions on what we've spoke today or anything that you've got from this uh, talk and you have like, you you curious about something else. Yeah, maybe about their practices. Also, okay. okay, maybe like for me, I feel like what, what you've said and then it's quite in, uh, what interests me is that uh, about the, the craft education, I think it's kind of everywhere. Yeah, because craft seem to be something so close to home, like it's like too maybe too ordinary or something that people would uh, it's I think it's kind of the old concept already about like what is craft and what is art and actually this that's what this exhibition is about, and yeah I mean but then that makes craftsmanship has let's uh I mean I mean less people interested in taking it seriously as higher education in a way. Mm -hmm. As Holly said, and I think it's the same as here in Thailand as well, you study craft, like in high school, in primary school, it's the basic that you have to be able to do it. But once you wanted to continue this practice in craftsmanship in maybe university, you couldn't really find anywhere to teach you uh, like, a foundation of it and I think it's many artists here or I mean who do, who, who do craft as as like as the main practice it's like maybe like this like doing something backward mm. like like having having something like bits bits and bob of everything and then later on uh, forming their own artistic practice and that's that's good in a way that so the creativity creativity and it's like it it doesn't it it doesn't has limits so the imagination really goes uh, over the like to like to, like this strict space of what is craft and what is art yeah mm -hmm. anyone has anything to add on this <laughs> So anyone has any questions from the floor? Yes, Peter Kai. Yes, has question for Jude. Yeah. 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 
I'm just wondering if you like, you know, from the first IELT and this IELTA and this one, do you have any, did you have like a different criteria for like selecting artists or even like coming up with the, um, the directions of oh. the triennial? Yeah, thanks, Jackai. Uh, look, the difference between the first one, IOTA 21, when our borders were closed, the international borders were closed, the state borders were closed, we couldn't have you come, which was very, very sad. The, the, but the criteria as far as the curators are concerned, which is me, and um, in this instance this year, my colleague Carola, has always been people who are passionate and absorbed and really have an idea that they want to communicate and can do that with skill. I don't see that changing, really. It's, it's, a, it's a fundamental. And that's the bit that gives us so much joy. We've been able to um, welcome so many Indonesian, Malaysian, African and Indian artists to Perth this year and they've all had a brilliant time. They've rushed around and done a lot of partying too, but it's been <laughs> very, very nice. So I hope to have you back next time, Jakai. Thank you. Thank you for the passion as well. I'm kind of curious about that too. Okay. Anyone has any more feedback or questions or shall we? Okay, so, yes. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the panellists both for your work and your wonderful presentation and the things that, the fascinating things that they've given us to think about. And I just want to pick up on something that has been in my mind during this talk based on a conversation I was having with Judy we touched on just before the talks began. And I'm wondering if, and this, if we talk about cultural diversity, but we're in a moment now in the world where artificial intelligence is doing away with cultural diversity and homogenizing a lot of uh, creative practice in the visual arts, in the music industry, in our lives in many different ways. And it seems to me that craft is something that AI will never do. So I'm one, which I, which I, applaud and I'm sure everyone in this room is very aware of that but I'm um, so so I guess my question is is there a thinking either within the craft community or within you and your practice about uh, the possibility of a changing value system that I would like to hope might be you know that might be coming in the near future and and needed yeah Melissa, that's yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I um, I I started researching. I have a blog that I occasionally publish rants on, and I hadn't <laughs> <laughs> published a good rant for a while. So um, last year, when there was a lot of um, controversy controversy about some of the uh, new AI uh, filters. Uh, uh, borrowing from specific artists and literally ripping off their style so that someone could put a filter over their selfies. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of started looking into that and uh, was interested in, in where AI was getting its intel from mm -hmm. and how then it was using um, that to reinterpret things. And so first of all, was pretty selfish about it and ran my own images through some of the larger AI databases to see uh, whether or not I had been scraped. And it turns out because uh, I married a software engineer, um, we've always had our data in silos that have been a little more protected. Um, you know, I have someone who reads the end user license agreements on my behalf occasionally, or at least knows some of them well enough to s steer away. And so I haven't ended up in any of the buckets. And so when I put some of my work through um, AI filters, I, I didn't, you know, I found interesting links between other artworks, like perhaps traditional Turkish plates or other kind of uh, raised forms, but nothing that did what I did entirely. And then um, I've also had experience working with um, uh, students and, and sorry, researchers at RMIT University um, 
Dr. Ben Dixon Ward and Dr. Chris Bang specifically, and they were attempting to use uh, GAN models to create uh, works uh, of, of potentially 3D design, but in the first instance, um, all of these models spit out images. They don't spit out 3D models as yet. I'm sure we'll get to a place where, you know, I've seen concrete printing technology and clay printing technology, and obviously we've got the PLA, all sorts of printing technologies. And even in the world of traditional jewellery, we have wax printing that then gets cast. And so it's very common for people to be able to print out a wax model, make sure it's allowed for shrinkage, cast that model and then make that work. But the still with casting, the the advantages are always at scale. You have to want to produce many, many, many items. So reproducing one-off weird items from a small scale art or craft practice is never going to make economic sense. So I think at the moment we are sort of saved or sheltered at least because we're doing such unique individual works. And so I think, yeah, potentially in the future, we might be some of the last people left that don't have our jobs eaten by a, mm. you know, a chat GPT, for instance. Yeah. But at the same time, maybe the chat GPT will make running our artist statements and our grant applications a lot simpler. So I'm not above using them, even yeah. though I haven't really started yet. Yeah. But the thing that I noticed with the RMIT research project, and RMIT is a university that's very strong in jewellery and metal smithing or gold and silver smithing in Australia. Um, the attempt then was to get the works that they had generated using this model. So I had to submit multiple pictures of my works and then using an oppositional model, which was based, I think, on um, probably something from the automotive industry. Um, because you need you need tens of thousands of images for it to start being able to kind of put out something that would be object-like. And so they used model images from the automotive industries, which kind of meant that my works ended up with kind of these hatches that looked more like car grills um, <laughs> because it couldn't really fathom what my work was doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the images weren't particularly complicated, but that it, it just needs far many than I've ever produced in my artistic career. Uh, so once they were made, um, the attempt then was to put them back onto a 3D object, but they are still a flat image on, even if you've made like a, a lovely round surface, you, you still are printing out a decal of some description and there's only so much that a decal can do. Um, even if it is wrapping around, it's got to wrap around a linear surface or it can't have too much movement to it or otherwise you start to get puckering and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think we're still safe, but I think, you know, knowing, yeah, knowing enough software engineers, they want to get there. They're coming for us, but yeah. <laughs> hopefully we're smarter than they are. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they've probably got other things on their minds too, you know, like ruling the world. So rather than making craft, but I think we all we all saw that during COVID, um, that people went to their homes and they started using their hands. And it's mm -hmm. such a human thing. Humans do need, we do need to use our hands and our eyes and our senses. Otherwise, I think we we just wither. It's it's a really core part of who we are. So I'm, you know, look, you can't work in the arts without being a flaming optimist. It's just not possible. <laughs> so, but I don't think anybody could make, AI could not make the piece Atty has around her neck. Mm -hmm. Not in any world ever. <laughs> and I think, um, yeah, the, the scary part maybe is, like I feel like a lot of art experimentation starts with mistakes mm -hmm. and just happy accidents. And we know AI makes mistakes. Like if you go to Google Translate, whatever, blah, 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 it's currently still makes mistakes and doesn't quite flow, but it's learning that it's what those mistakes are. And so once it maybe gets that, you know, those, it will smooth out those creases of those mistakes, but then it will have learnt what mistakes are and how that could then translate back into creative thinking. I don't know. Yeah. 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 I mean, for me, I mean, a little bit about the AI because sometimes I think this is what I've 
heard about is that it's gonna be snake eating on its own tail mm. in a way on mm. AI. Whatever you put on the computer, it will learn from that. But eventually, it would didn't learn anything new. But we are uh, with human experiences. Yeah. We would still learning something new in a way. Yeah, maybe hoping <laughs> that that we wouldn't like let it like consume us in a way. Maybe mm. like it. We have to be careful. Mm. Yeah, about that. Mm. Yeah. yeah Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So I think this uh, is about time to wrap up this session. And please say for uh, uh, maybe like a, a casual talk, the opening reception. But today we have uh, Jude, Holly, Melissa with us. Uh, yeah. Uh, from 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 Western uh from Western Australia from Perth, and today we also have three artists with us as well, Kun Pinari, Kun Rudi, and Widi. So so later on, if uh after a short talk uh, a short like introduction to the exhibition later, you you guys could hang around and talk to artists or uh, maybe discuss about uh, among yourself about what you've heard today. Okay, thank. Thank you very much and yeah. Thank you, Arthur. Please stay, we are going to start soon <laughs> anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Please give us about 10 minutes to clear out the space and then we'll be ready for the reception. Mm -hmm. uh, while we're clearing out the space, please feel free to see the artwork on the other side of the, uh, the space. And thank you so much.